Man, you can be seated. You can join me in opening your Bibles to Luke 24. And if you don't have a Bible with you, we have them under chairs all around, so you can grab one from underneath the seat and open up to Luke 24, and that's on page 884 in those uh, Bibles. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank You for Your Word, and so we pray now as we read it and consider it together that You would open our eyes, the eyes of our hearts, to perceive Your glory in Jesus and the truth and beauty and goodness of the good news. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're in a series, a sermon series titled, Jesus Has Something to Say About That, and the assumption of this series is that Jesus is worth listening to. So, He has authority to speak to issues that matter to us, issues that people have all sorts of opinions about, we have opinions about, but Jesus' opinion is the one that matters. So, Jesus calls us to adjust to Him. But why should we listen to Jesus? Why should we privilege His voice above anyone else's, even our own? That's an important question, especially for this series, because this isn't just about sifting through Jesus' teaching and keeping what we like. This is acknowledging that Jesus is the source of all wisdom and that He has wisdom even if we at first don't think it's wise. If we disagree with Him, it's us who need to do the rethinking. So, here is the question then, is that reasonable? Is this kind of absolute deference to Jesus a rational way to live? And the answer to that question comes down to what we are talking about today, which is the resurrection of Jesus, Easter. If Jesus rose from the dead, that confirms everything He said about who He was who He is. He's the one who made us, who rules us, and therefore it's reasonable for us to adjust to Him. A lot of people today are skeptical about Jesus, of course, and the claim of His resurrection, but here's one thing that may come as a surprise. The early Christians were the first skeptics. Those who ended up leading the Christian movement, by the power of the Spirit, doubted Jesus' resurrection at first. So, the early church and all through the church, and, and this church right here, was filled and is filled with former skeptics, former atheists, former doubters. And the accounts of the resurrection were written with skeptics in mind. So, we're going to look at one of them this morning, and this is in the Gospel of Luke. Luke said that his purpose in writing was to give an accurate credible, historic account of Jesus all the way through to this final chapter, which is His resurrection. So, he wrote the story of Jesus' resurrection in chapter 24 to help people move from doubt to trust, to faith. This chapter is focused on how people moved from skepticism to belief and joy and purpose. So, Maybe you consider yourself a skeptic, or maybe you consider yourself a Christian, but you still have many doubts, and those doubts keep you from wholeheartedly following Jesus and obeying Jesus and adjusting to Jesus. So, this morning, we're going to look at Luke 24 to engage our doubts and enter into the joy of faith. So, we'll read the whole chapter together and then walk uh, through this. So, Luke 24. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they, these women, went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel, and as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, "'Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen.' Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. 
Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. Verse 13, that very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it's now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They went at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us even went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And Jesus said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he was going further, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward the evening, and day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the Scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon, that's Peter, And they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. Verse 38, And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate before them. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, He blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. Well, this story has uh, a number of scenes, four main scenes that we follow as we're carried along through it. They aren't hard to see, and we'll move through each one of them. We see the tomb, the road, the room and the sky. And these four scenes, as they progress, we see people move from doubt to trust. And when they trust, they're not taking a blind leap of faith. Their doubts throughout this story and every scene are engaged reasonably, and by the end, they're moving into a life not only of belief, but also of purpose and joy. 
and we can too. So there are reasons to doubt your doubts and live with trust and joy and purpose. So the first scene is the tomb. So this is Sunday morning at dawn. Jesus was crucified and buried on Friday. A few female disciples saw where his body was placed, and so then on Sunday, they brought spices to the tomb to help with the, probably the smell of the decaying body. But when they showed up, the stone that had blocked the entrance was rolled away, and the tomb was empty. So they're perplexed. They have no idea what's going on. They did not expect, clearly from this story, they did not expect to come to the tomb and find that Jesus had risen. They expected to find his dead body, but it's just empty. Then they see two men there dressed in dazzling white. These are clearly angels. Often the Bible, angels are described as appearing just like people because that's how they looked. They didn't have wings, and so they tell the women that Jesus rose just as he told them he would. Then the women remembered that Jesus did say that he would rise. So these women ran to a gathering where the apostles were, right? these disciples who had followed Jesus for years now, and they tell them what happened, and they didn't believe him. Peter, at least, had the sense to take the claim seriously enough to run to the tomb to check it out, so he ran there and found it just as they said, and so he came back marveling. So this whole chapter is showing how people move from doubt initially to belief. And here at the beginning, everyone begins as a skeptic. Everyone is either confused or dismissive about the empty tomb. And then we see that in each case, they're not told, just believe. What's your problem? Just have faith. They're presented with evidence. They're called to reasonable trust. So look at this. First, we see the women. They go to the tomb expecting to see Jesus' body laying there and just to put spices on his body to keep the smell down. It's like people decorating a tombstone today. But then they find the tomb open and empty and they don't think, we knew it. He's alive. No, they're totally confused. The two angels tell them what happened and they remind them that Jesus already foretold this. So they remembered his words and then they believed. And notice this is all very reasonable. They experience an angelic encounter which, you know, we may find peculiar today, but if it happened, then you take it seriously, right? If that happened to you, you would take it seriously. And these angels reasoned with them by helping them remember Jesus' own words. So the women leave not with a blind faith, but with a real experience, angelic messengers, and with evidence, remembering that Jesus himself had predicted this. So they've seen an empty tomb, they've encountered the angels, they've remembered Jesus' predictions, and that's all compelling to them. And then we see the apostles' initial response. They, when they hear about this, have eyewitness testimony of these women who present to them their experience, and they don't believe it. They completely dismiss the idea. We do see Peter at least have the sense to go check it out, and he went to the empty tomb. The linen burial cloths were still there, it says. So if someone had stolen the body, they wouldn't have left those. They would have been the only thing worthy, worth of any value. So Peter now is marveling at the situation. So, so far, this is all very different than how modern readers expect the story to go. We think our modern worldview makes us properly skeptical of this kind of thing and that they were more gullible back then, or they were at least more open and inclined to believe a resurrection claim like this. But that's not what happened. And when we understand their worldview and how they thought, it actually makes sense. Their worldview made them no more inclined to believe this than we do today. The apostles had a Jewish worldview shaped by a mix of Scripture and tradition. Many Jewish people didn't even believe in the idea of a resurrection at all, but others like the apostles did. But no one thought that someone would rise in the middle of history like this, with an incorruptible body, never to die again, right here in the middle of history. They reasoned from texts like Daniel 12 in the Old Testament that there would be a resurrection one day, but that it would be a general resurrection at the culmination of history. There would be a large scale rising from the dead of all God's people at the end of the age, or really all people, some to judgment and some to eternal life and a new creation. 
They'd rise to a new kind of existence, never to die again, while uh, the whole world was changed. But they never expected one person to rise in the middle of history to live this new kind of resurrection experience while the rest of the world just keeps going on as it always did. The resurrection was part of a cosmic transformation. So we can't say that the disciples were just so hoping for the resurrection because of their their worldview and their expectations from Scripture that when Jesus died, that they just so hoped for a resurrection that they hallucinated it. No one was expecting it. They were not expecting it. They didn't even have a category for it. So when Jesus had already told them that he would rise, it didn't even slot into their categories. And then the Greek and Roman worldview didn't lead people to believe this either. They didn't believe in a physical resurrection at all. This shows us that they they were not more inclined to believe the resurrection claim than we are. The resurrection of Jesus wasn't plausible even to Jesus' own disciples. So everyone in this story initially responds to the empty tune either confused or entirely skeptical. But then some start to come around as they think it through, God opens their heart, they consider evidence, they become open. So the question for you this morning may simply be this, are you open to the possibility that Jesus rose? Are you open to exploring the evidence and thinking it through? The second scene is the road. So this is verses 13 to 32, and here we see two people move from doubt to faith. So this is now the afternoon on this same Sunday. Two disciples are walking. These are not two of the 12, but are part of a broader circle of Jesus' followers. They're walking from Jerusalem to a village named Emmaus. It's a seven-mile walk, and they're depressed. They're talking together about Jesus' ministry and his death, and like everyone else, they thought this was the end. So now we learn that they've heard the report of the women that the tomb was empty, They heard the claim that Jesus rose, but they don't believe it. They still assume that Jesus is dead and the Jesus movement is over. And then Jesus found them talking on the road, walking on the road, and he decided to keep them from recognizing him, from seeing his identity. Now, that's obviously mysterious. Don't know exactly how he did it, but he presented himself to them as a stranger walking along the road, and he asked them what they're talking about. Of course, he knew. Jesus is always doing this. He's setting up conversations to draw people out because he often has a plan to steer conversation in a direction that he wants it to go. And here's agenda is to overcome their doubts. So one of them says to Jesus in verse 18, probably regretted this later, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know these things that have happened here in these days? Then they tell him all about Jesus. Look at verse 19. And they say to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. Then they say they had hoped that Jesus was the one to redeem Israel, but now it's over. They even share that they heard already the story of the women seeing the empty tomb and encountering angels and hearing that he rose. But once again, we see people who doubt at first. They were skeptical. They didn't have a category for this resurrection. They didn't even believe when the women and Peter said what they experienced. So Jesus now addresses their unbelief. He doesn't reveal himself yet, but he does tell them that they should have known better by now. They should have had enough evidence to believe this. He said that their problem is that they're slow of heart to believe the Scriptures. And then look at verses 25 and 27. O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, was it not necessary that the Christ, the Messiah, this coming one, should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses, it's the first five books of the Bible, and all the prophets, he interpreted them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So he tells them that they didn't have the right expectations. The Old Testament is all about Jesus. It anticipated his life, his sufferings and death, his resurrection to glory. They're obviously impressed. 
that this man knows the Bible so well. So they ask him to stay for dinner at the village, and he does. And it's there over the meal that Jesus reveals himself to them. He breaks bread, gives it to them, opens their eyes to see him, and then he vanished. And they sat in shock. And in verse 32, they said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us when he talked to us on the road, when he opened the scriptures to us? So Jesus had walked through the Old Testament, showing that it was all about him. And they're looking back saying, our hearts were burning inside when he did that. Now that's the goal of Bible reading and Bible study and biblical preaching. We understand God's word. We see how Jesus is the point of it all and our hearts burn within us. It's my goal every Sunday here. It should be our goal every day as we engage with God's Word. So, this is their journey from doubt to faith. They had the evidence before them already. They knew Jesus and His predictions. They had the Scriptures, which foretold His death and resurrection. They heard the women's account of the empty tomb. They heard the angel's announcement uh, through the witness of the women of His resurrection, and they still doubted. Why? Well, part of the reason is because of their own expectations. They, they still didn't have the expectations that Jesus would die and rise. They were expecting Him, they said, to redeem Israel. They had hoped that He would redeem Israel. They wanted a great new deliverance, probably from the Romans. And Jesus was, in all appearances, conquered by the Romans and then the leaders. And so they're sad. In their mind, Jesus let them down, so they're walking depressed and doubting. Maybe that's the reason you or maybe others whom you know doubt. We may have the evidence before us, and we don't realize it because we doubt because Jesus doesn't really fit our expectations. He's not lining up with what we expected Him to be like, and so we're not so sure of it after all. Maybe your story is something like this. I was open to Jesus I trusted him in some measure, but then my dad suffered terribly and died. That same year, I lost my job. I had hoped that Jesus would help, but he didn't. So now I don't even believe. That's like the story of these two disciples. They had certain expectations for Jesus. Jesus didn't meet those expectations, so they were sad. And therefore, they were closed off to changing and adjusting their expectations. But Jesus found them. He walked with them. He reshaped their expectations, and He opened their eyes, and they went from doubt to faith. So then they got up, ran back along that seven-mile road to Jerusalem, and they ran to the other disciples. And so now we see the third scene, the room. So this is still that first day, that first Sunday. Now it's later evening. This room is full of disciples. The apostles are there along with other followers of Jesus. These two disciples have now arrived. On their way, they heard about Peter and or ran into Peter and found out that Jesus had appeared to him. So they say in verse 34, the Lord has risen indeed, and he's appeared to Simon, that is Simon Peter, and then they tell their own story. And then Jesus himself came and stood among them. And said to all those in the room, peace to you. So now they have the risen Christ among them. Surely we would think, I would believe if I saw Jesus with my own eyes. And yet at least at first, they don't think it's him. They slot this experience into their own categories again. And the most plausible interpretation is that this is some kind of spirit. And then listen to how Jesus continues patiently yet directly engaging their skepticism. Verses 38 to 40, he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. Now, they very well may have been convinced that it was Jesus, but they may also think that this is just a spirit, that he's not truly physically resurrected. So, what does Jesus do? Well, he doesn't harshly rebuke them for their doubt here. He says, do you have anything to eat? And they gave him some fish. 
and he ate it. It's clear that he was doing it just to prove that he could, to prove that it's really him. He really rose. Ghosts don't eat fish. And then he keeps going. He reminded them that he had predicted this ahead of time. Then he reminded them that this is, again, what the Old Testament had said. This is where the whole Old Testament story was heading to a Messiah who would suffer, die for the sins of his people, rise again on the third day. Once again, we see people move from doubt to faith. And at no point does Jesus just say, just believe. At no point do we see any understanding of faith like we hear sometimes today, that faith is believing something even if there's no evidence for the truth of it, even if there's no rational reason to believe this, even if it's totally unreasonable, you just believe anyway. No, at every stage, Jesus is engaging with them. He's reasoning with them. He's even giving evidence to them. By the end, the apostles have eyewitness testimony from the women of the empty tomb. They have Jesus' fulfilled predictions that he himself said. They have the Old Testament whole storyline anticipating this. They've seen Jesus' own risen, resurrected, fish-eating body with their own eyes. They saw the scars. And now they not only believe, but they're filled with joy and they're given purpose because they realize that this matters for them and this matters for the world. It matters for all of history because it means that the story of Jesus keeps going, their story keeps going, and the story of God's redemption keeps going. It's not over. It's just the beginning. So the opposite of doubt then in this chapter is not just belief. It's also joyful purpose. Listen to how Jesus put it here in verses 46 to 49. Thus it is written that the Christ, the Messiah, should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that, and now here's where he gives them their purpose, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. And then he addresses them, you are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, that's the Holy Spirit, but stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. So these disciples are now his witnesses, and they're sent into the world. They're to proclaim repentance and forgiveness in his name, beginning in Jerusalem, and then to the ends of the earth. And that leads to the last scene, which is the sky. At some point later, Jesus led them out of the city, and he blessed them, and he ascended and disappeared from them as he went into heaven, a heavenly reality. So the story began with doubt, and then it ends in verses 52 and 53 like this. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. So the chapter began with skepticism, doubt, unbelief, and sadness, and it continues and ends with faith and joy. Ever since then, Jesus has moved people along this same journey from doubt to joy. Each one of us is somewhere along this journey. Sometimes you may feel like you take a step forward. Other times it feels like you take a step or two back. So my question for you, just to consider to yourself right now, is where are you on this journey? From skepticism and doubt to belief to joyful purpose. You may consider yourself a skeptic, but Consider if you've ever given this story, the claims, the evidence, a fair hearing. Maybe this is the first time that you realize Christians take the intellect seriously. They take evidence seriously. They take rationality seriously. And that Christians got this from Jesus. Or maybe you've seen the evidence. You've spent time considering the claims of Scripture and of Jesus. And you still doubt So the invitation for you is to keep seeking, keep looking, think it through, and then be open, honestly open, to respond in a way that's fitting with what you learn. Many in this chapter saw evidence but did not embrace the reasonable conclusion. The disciples had Jesus' predictions. They had the Scripture storyline that pointed to this. They had the women's testimony of an angelic encounter. 
They had Peter's confirmation of the empty tomb and meeting Jesus, and they still doubted. And Jesus is patient with them and gives them even more evidence. But do you notice through this chapter, he also does rebuke them for not embracing this earlier. They had enough evidence already. All through this chapter, there's a mix of patience for doubters, but also at times a gentle or direct rebuke for being slow to believe. So maybe you find yourself there. What is still holding you back from trusting Jesus and coming under His authority, receiving the forgiveness of your sins, following Him as your Savior and King? He said that now repentance and forgiveness is proclaimed in His name. So maybe you need to, this morning, decisively receive forgiveness of sins from the risen Christ, repent of your sins, and trust with joy. Others of you may be younger, and maybe you've not really considered this very deeply. Some of you are in middle school or high school, college. You maybe have grown up in a Christian home. You've believed in some, at some level as you grew up. And then as you've grown up, you felt more and more distant from those early beliefs. Maybe you're here even kind of on Sunday, first time in a church in a year or two, or maybe more. And maybe you're kind of surprised to be considering this intellectually and seriously right now. Maybe you still, though, have plenty of doubts. So I just want to encourage you, whether you're still younger, maybe in your parents' home, or you've moved on, to engage with your doubts. Write them down. Ask for help thinking them through. If someone doesn't answer you or dismisses your doubts or says, just believe, uh, find someone else. Don't give up. Jesus took doubters seriously. So if you find a Christian who doesn't take doubt seriously, talk to a different kind of Christian. Don't dismiss it altogether. Uh, Talk to a leader here in our church. Ask for resources. We have some on the table in the resource center this morning for you to consider. Don't put it off. Engage with your doubts. Others of you may have a firm and reasonable faith, but at some point, you will doubt. Maybe you're in high school and you have no doubts, but within a few years, they may come and they may come strong. It happened to me even just a few years ago. I had a couple years when every few days I would think, and this, I mean, this is just like three or four years ago, every few days I would just think, wait, is this true? And I had to engage with those doubts. I don't know what they were doing there, but they were there. And I didn't want to ignore it. So I engaged with all the reasons again. And I'd have to go through my mind again and rethink it through. What is the alternative? What is naturalism? And does that make sense of morality and truth and beauty and goodness and love and meaning? What about the other worldview options? Do those make sense of our experience? What about the claims of Jesus in Scripture and so forth? And sometimes have to just re-enter three days later because I'm all of a sudden thinking again, wait, is this, is this true or are we just making this stuff up? I have to rethink it through again because the doubts would come again. Sometimes you have to do this. It's hard to explain why we doubt sometimes. But it doesn't mean that it's not reasonable to believe. It's just that our minds and hearts are complex. And we sometimes have to re-engage with the reasons to believe. Jesus is not bothered by that. Look at him all through this chapter. He's patient, walking people through this, giving reasons, talking it through. At some point, He may bring a gentle rebuke or a firm rebuke, but he's patient. Others of you may believe and not have any doubts, and if that's you, then the question is this. Are you living in the joy and the purpose of faith? Jesus doesn't end by congratulating them for believing. He sends them on mission. He says that they're his witnesses, and the world needs to know. They've now journeyed from doubt to faith, They're now sent to help others. They're sent to do this as a central part of the calling of their life. Every Christian is now invited into this mission as well. You've come to faith. You're sent to help others. And we do this near and far. We do this with our neighbors, family members, friends, coworkers. We take this beyond. We take this to other nations This is why we're committed as a church to sending the gospel to the unreached and least reached places around the world. 
So how do we move into this purpose of our mission? Well, once we believe, how do we step into this mission to help others believe? Well, one way we learn from this chapter is to help people learn the story of Jesus. Give them a Bible. Encourage them to read the Gospel of Luke. Ask them what they think of this chapter, chapter 24. Parents, you have a great opportunity. The Lord gives you children to help them come to know Jesus personally. And one way you're called to do this is to engage with their questions and engage with their doubts. Studies show that one of the determining factors for kids not leaving the faith when they go to college and beyond is that they had a safe environment at home to talk through their doubts and questions. Their skepticism wasn't dismissed. It was engaged with understanding and love. And every Christian has a calling to help other people have a safe environment to engage with their questions, to help them come to know Jesus. So we're his witnesses in the world. And this chapter gives us a model for how to do this. All through the chapter, Jesus is engaging people with their questions. And if you can't answer someone's skeptical question, that's fine. Don't be scared of that. You're on a journey too then. Just affirm that's a good question. Help them find an answer. It matters because they matter, and truth matters. So this chapter invites us to bring our doubts into the open, not stuff them down. Make sure also that we're open to doubting our doubts because the Scriptures in Jesus predicted His resurrection. The tomb is empty. The women and the disciples were eyewitnesses. Jesus appeared to many people to confirm this reality, and now He's alive, and He sends us to proclaim repentance and forgiveness in His name. And so, back to the beginning, this is why it matters that we listen to Jesus. This is why when Jesus speaks to something, we can say, okay, I'm going to adjust to you. Because Jesus made us, He died for us, He rose again, He's reigning, He's the source of all wisdom, and He's coming again. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank You for this chapter. Thank You that You had this written by Luke, and You had it written in the exact way You wanted it written so that we could hear it as Your very Word to us this morning. We thank You for Your patience and gentleness with us in our doubts. We thank You for bringing us on this journey to faith and giving us joy and purpose and mission. And so we pray even now, this very moment, you would help people in this room, help us all to be honest about our thinking, how we feel, our questions, and we pray that you lead us to truth. For your namesake, in Jesus, amen.